Over four of our recent videos, we've discussed the worst jobs undertaken by military personnel in the Second World War and the Vietnam War. And seeing as we don't give a trench rat about linear progression, we'll now be heading back to the early 1900s and the so-called Great War. As with our previous videos, we won't be overlapping any examples. Best to change your socks after this one, troopers. Trench foot is some nasty business. Sappers have been boring tunnels through the ground and undermining fortifications since the ancient times, and these same tactics were employed in the First World War, during which men rotted in trench stalemates for months and years on end. The unfortunate souls consigned to tunneling duties were best described as miners, and while some miners were trained for that job specifically, many were just infantrymen made beasts of burden. The miners' main objectives were to break stalemates by tunneling under enemy trenches and caving them in with explosives, and this process could take as long as a year. All the while, miners were prone to fatigue, sickness, and gruesome death. The tunnels were often tight, dark, and cold, and they were sometimes flooded. When the earth gave way, miners were entombed, crushed or drowned and natural gas pockets and gases effused by man-made explosives could poison and asphyxiate them and even catch fire. Private Doland Hodge described the work as stuffy, filthy, oppressive, dangerous and just frightful. And he went on to say, you were down there on your hands and knees for hours on end. It was the most tiring and painful work I ever did on the Western Front. And this doesn't take into account countermining or what happened when two opposing tunnels met. When the latter occurred, underground combat would follow. The fighting was often in the dark and with daggers, picks, shovels, bits of wood and other improvised weapons. In an interview, tunneling expert Colin Wynn said, Some people have asked me, how did they know who they were stabbing? The simple answer is that they used to put their hand out and grab their opponent's shoulder. If he'd got an apollet, then he was German. The largest mining operations of the Great War were carried out in Belgium during the Battle of Messin, in which tunnelling companies of the Royal Engineers of the British Army, aided by British, Canadian, Australian and New Zealand miners, detonated 447 tonnes of explosives under German lines, killing some 10,000 Germans. Overall, the casualty rate of Allied miners was around 1,200 a month. While miners cut the earth below the surface of the battlefield, wiring parties cut barbed wire upon it. These parties, also referred to as wiring sappers or cutters, undertook a tense and dangerous job, not only cutting enemy barbed wire obstacles, but also repairing and rebuilding their own. And without these wiring parties, many more men would have been snared and killed crossing no man's land. In the cover of night, cutters would stealthily approach either their own or their enemy's lines, using a range of specialized tools to repair, rebuild, or sabotage barbed wire obstacles. While working in the dark and sleeping in the day was taxing in itself, cutters had to haul unwieldy loads over unfavorable terrain and keep ever vigilant for the eye of the enemy. Searchlights scoured the battlefield and enemy sentries were trained specifically to look and hear for wiring parties. One wrong step, one chink of metal on metal, and they could be more bullets than men. At the start of the war, posts and pickets were used to support barbed wire structures, and these were hammered into the earth with a mallet. This, however, alerted the enemy to the cutter's positions and preceded the use of screw pickets, which could be twisted silently into the ground. In his 1936 memoir, Canadian veteran Charles Henry Savage wrote, Working with barbed wire was a nasty job under any circumstances, but when you were handling it in the dark and within a hundred yards of rifles and machine guns that would shoot at the least sound, you were doing one of the most nerve-wracking bits of work that could possibly be imagined. If a flare went up, you had to stop work and stand perfectly still, even if a bit of wire happened to be pressing into some particularly sensitive part of your anatomy. When a machine gun swept your way, it meant getting flat amongst barbed wire. The slightest move might mean death for half your party. 
What was worse, perhaps, is that a big part of the job was dislodging corpses caught in the wire. They could belong to both enemies and friends. As British veteran Robert Graves recalled in his memoir, Goodbye to All That, Once, I snatched my fingers in horror from where I'd planted them on the slimy body of an old corpse. Crawling, watching, crawling, shamming dead under the blinding lights of enemy flares, and again, crawling, watching, crawling. While sabotaging enemy wires was a sort of raid in itself, true trench raiders or trench sweepers set out at night to infiltrate enemy trenches, killing or capturing enemy troops, destroying or capturing equipment, gathering intelligence and simply harrying enemy troops with the intent of disrupting their sleep and sapping their morale. Small, lightly equipped teams of trench raiders crept upon sentries in the cover of night, taking them out as quietly as they could and then proceeding to the trenches. Once in the trenches, the bayonets, trench knives, brass knuckles, spikes clubs and entrenching tools came out. Firing a gun was a last resort, and when the raiders had achieved their objective or otherwise decided it was time to give it legs, they got rid of all their grenades, covering their exit with shrapnel. Sidney and Matt of the London Regiment described the onset of a raid. The idea was to crawl through the German wire and try and get underneath and jump into their frontline trench. Dispose whoever was holding it by bayonet, if possible without making any noise, or clubbing over the head with the butt. Then you drop into the trench. Charles Quinnell of the Royal Fusiliers saw the raids as pointless. It was a waste of time. We just hated it. There was some general about 30 miles behind the lines wanting to know who was on the opposite side. He ought to have the job himself. Agreeing with Quinnell was an officer only known as F. Jourdain. Every raid I've heard of always involved a disproportionate number of casualties for what they got out of it. An officer in the Gloucestershire Regiment known as Charles Wilson, however, thought trench raids were necessary to find out what troops were in the line opposite. Wilson also said, Another benefit was to get the men accustomed to getting out into no man's land, not to feel that they must be safe in a trench. Now, as we just said, on the other hand of a trench raid were sentries, Troops charged with keeping an eye out for the enemy and alerting their friends. It was for this reason that they were prime targets, just like radio operators. Additionally, sentries were not afforded the same degree of cover as their friends deeper in the trenches or in bunkers, and they could not, by military law, fall asleep, lest they pay the ultimate price. In British soldier Harry Drinkwater's diary, the following account was recorded. Snowed all night. Had a hard job to keep awake. One or two fellows, of whom I was one, were found to be fast asleep at the end of their century. We'd gone to sleep standing up, and the relief man was also asleep. Under military law, this is a crime of the first water, punishable by execution. New Zealand private John Jack Dunn came down with pneumonia in Gallipoli, and after receiving treatment in a hospital on a Greek island, he was found asleep on sentry duty. For his offence, Dunn was court-martialed and sentenced to death according to the following clause in the Manual of Military Law. A sentinel found asleep or drunk at his post while on active service would, if the character and circumstances of the offence were sufficiently grave, be liable to suffer death. On further appeal, however, with consideration to his illness, Dunn's sentence was remitted and he was sentenced instead to just 10 years of hard labour. The poor man died in war before he could carry the sentence out, however. One French soldier, on the other hand, thought sleep was near impossible. The time crawls as if paralysed. This guard duty will never end. The man who was determined not to sleep can feel his eyes about to close, but he will not sleep. He will feel the cold and the rain. He will slip occasionally into swift unconsciousness, but he will not sleep. There is always the rain, always the winter always the shadow. So, those were but four of the worst jobs of the First World War, and so far, I've got to say that trench raiding takes the cake. But which of those four do you think would have been the worst for yourself? Also, because you already know we're going to make one, which jobs do you think will feature in our second part to this video? Let us know in the comment section below. And as usual guys, just before you go, make sure you check out the links in the description below if you want to join our wider history community. You can join us on Discord to chat to myself and other history buffs, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook if you want access to exclusive content that you won't find on the YouTube channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.